so my name is uh, Gopi Krishnan Murlitharan. I go by Gopi if you're not in the mood to spell, spell out my name. Uh, so I was actually uh, relieved uh, to hear that yesterday, one of the talks that they have, uh, the speaker has never met John, uh, but I have at least met him once. Uh, so I'm, I'm actually relieved that I can give the talk. Uh, so yeah, it was uh, early in my PhD career in 2015 or so. Uh, I had similar experience to you know whatever everyone was uh, giving. I was uh, explaining him my work on Boson sampling and the way he make you feel important is what I still uh, carry around in my mind. I mean, even if you are a, a second year or third year PhD student, um, most of the speakers just come talk to you without even being interested in what you want to say because they want to speak to the faculties and other postdocs. But John was different, and and you know that's what I have in mind about him. Uh, so I uh, just a couple of days ago I joined Macquarie University as a postdoc. I had to work with Gavin and also Dominic Berry. Uh, I did my PhD at uh, University of New Mexico with Ivan Deutsch, and then moved to Los Alamos National Lab where I did my first postdoc with Rolando Soma, and uh, I ended up here after that. Uh, so uh, since this is a uh, John Dowling Memorial Conference, I thought I'll uh, talk to everyone about uh, you know my work on boson sampling during my PhD. Uh, all right, uh, let's go. So I'll be talking about uh, complexity of sampling bosonic atoms in the presence of weak interactions. So. Uh, Okay, so uh, okay, yeah, thank you. So, uh, all right. So, uh, in in these three days of uh, talks, I have I haven't seen uh, you know any introductory material about boson sampling, so I thought I'll add uh, some uh, motivation and introductory stuff uh, about that. Uh, so, you know, uh, about the motivation to why we do these kind of things. Uh, we we know about the extended Turing Turing thesis, uh, which says that any, I would say any natural process or any uh, computational problem uh, can be solved by a realistic device. Uh, it can also be solved by a Turing machine. That was basically the uh, Turing thesis. And we have been trying really hard since then to prove it wrong in some sense, at, uh, to say that some corner device can do it better. Uh, next please. And, you know, uh, and not many talks will be uh, incomplete without this quote from uh, Richard Feynman, uh, which says that you know nature is not classical; uh, it's it's quantum. So if you try to uh, solve uh, problems in nature with a classical computer, you might take a lot of time and a lot of resource. So you should uh, try quantum computers in the next. Then we had to wait till uh, in the early 90s uh, for the Schoss algorithm and uh, you know, uh, eventual uh, quantum error correction to try. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, recently, what we have been, you know, looking at is this uh, NIST era, uh, basically uh, saying that uh, whenever a, uh, some kind of quantum computer can do a specific task, much better than what a classic computer is available now, uh, we say that uh, you know it does something better than uh, uh, the classical computers. Uh, we say that we have achieved quantum computational advantage or supremacy. We can debate on that, but uh, I put supremacy here. Uh, and next, please. So there have been many proposals to use these uh, noisy uh, intermediate scale uh, quantum devices, uh, you know, some quantum simulation of many body physics, which I think is one of the earliest uh, proposal for uh, using these devices. And then we have the sampling complexity where uh, Google, uh, Boson sampling, IQP, and many other uh, proposals. Next, please. Uh, so uh, this talk would be uh, mainly about boson sampling, but not with photons, but with our hero neutral atoms uh, in optical addresses. So uh, why you could uh, answer that question with different uh, ways? It's potentially scalable uh, and experimentally, I would say it's more feasible than linear optics and in terms of preparation or uh, counting the atoms. And it's also a flexible platform to study the connection between this complexity and, and many other things like simulation and other things. Next, please. So, uh, you know, we all know about the computational complexity theory about uh, decision problems or counting problems. 
but in contrast with all that, the sampling complexity is, is not about solving some decision problems. It's about how hard is it to sample from a probability distribution. And you know, there are examples where, uh, for example, binomial distribution, which you can get you know, by tossing coins or, or more precisely a golden board, uh, can do the sampling in, in polynomial time. But there are some complex probability distribution, as, as we will see, uh, that classical machines cannot efficiently generate samples from that. And, and that's where the term sampling complexity comes from. Next, please. Oh, thanks. So this right here is a simulation of a, a golden board. I shamelessly uh, did that in MATLAB. Uh, uh, so uh, you might have seen this in, in gambling stations in Las Vegas, or I don't know what's equivalent in Australia. Uh, so, which basically you can see that uh, you know uh, at the bottom you have some probability distribution, and, and these are the samples from that distribution. And if you you know carefully look at it, it's the binomial distribution, and this is the probability distribution for that. Uh, but if you replace these balls with uh, some kind of quantum particle, which has to be bosons. Uh, say photons or or neutral atoms, and suddenly you get this very complex uh, probability distribution, and it has been shown that it it, it becomes very hard for classical computers to uh, sample from that. Uh, okay, just a little bit um, brief introduction of linear optics. So uh, linear optics uh, is when you know some kind of scattering uh, process where uh, the evolution of the creation operator can be written as a linear combination of uh, the uh, other creation operators. And that's the meaning of uh, linear optics. And uh, you can see that this transformation is totally uh, the photon number conserving, so input and output ideally uh, photon number conserving. And you know, uh, we can build these linear optical networks using phase shifters and beam splitters. And this is, uh, this is uh, just a, a sample of that. So you have you know many input modes output modes and then a bunch of beam splitters and phase shifters that make up uh, the linear optical networks and uh, you know it was uh, shown uh, in this paper by Aronson and Akipov that uh, if if you look at the probability distribution of some configurations at the end uh, like for example all one in all the modes uh, you can see that uh, what comes out is the permanent of uh, matrix, uh, scattering matrix, so uh, what what is called lambda there, and any other configurations you could actually build uh, the matrix of whose permanent would be the probability distribution. And uh, let me just you know uh, show you a very simple case to see how this permanent arises. So uh, let's look at a two input and two output mode. Uh, very simple case. Uh, we have two photons coming in, and then you are looking at the case where you have one photon each in in uh, first and second. So there's two possible ways you can do that. They can just pass through without deflecting. And the other way, so sorry, for that, uh, the probability amplitude is lambda 1, 1 times lambda 2, 2. And then the other one can cross their path and end up being in the exactly identical state. And for that, we have the probability amplitude lambda 1, 2 times 2, 1. And in quantum mechanics, you add the probabilities and then uh, square to find the probability. And there you have the uh, permanent coming up. So permanent is basically the determinant, but without the alternating uh, minus signs. Uh, so similarly, if you scale up, you can see that there are several permutations that end up being uh, um, at the same configuration, and then you have to add up all those amplitudes, and, and that is exactly what a permanent is. Um, so you know, from the uh, Alex Archipov and Scott Aronson's paper, uh, we have this theorem that this boson sampling is not efficiently solvable by a classic computer unless you know the polynomial hierarchy collapses to the third level and uh, this is both true in the case of exact sampling and also in the case of approximate sampling under some uh, you know conditions uh, conjectures so uh, you know the what we actually worked on uh, with Ivan and others were uh, how can we implement this boson sampling uh, using neutral atoms in optical lattices um, because of several, I mean, because um, in, in the case of photons and linear optics, there were the preparation of Fox states or photon counting measurements were not up to the mark. Uh, 
So what happens in the uh, neutral atom, we have these kind of Hamiltonians. Uh, we can start with no interaction, uh, just a free um, model. So we have some hopping amplitude, and then we have this uh, B dagger B term. And if you exponentiate that to find what the unitary transformation is, uh, you can quickly see that uh, it's again um, a linear transformation in the uh, creation operators. All right, so we wanted to go, you know, even even further, like e even simpler case, like you know, when people say that a linear uh, optics can generate something uh, that is quantum advantages or or that classical computer cannot do, it's already uh, pretty surprising. Uh, but what if we go one step further and look at the case where when you only have uniform hopping and nearest neighbor? This is one of the simplest case that we have you know, all studied. And without interaction, we know we all know how to solve it. And uh, I just want to stress, you know, uh, throughout my uh, career, I've been very obsessed with uh, when people say something is efficiently solvable. You know, what they really mean is, you know, in this case, you can write down what the eigenfunction is, or in in some basis. But uh, what people mean by efficient, you have to tell what the input, what the process, and the measurement. You know, all the three parts have to be specified before you can say that it, it's efficient. So, uh, for example, uh, in this case, you can actually write down uh, what the you know, eigenstates are because it's um, going to the uh, Fourier domain and these are all uh, momentum states uh, because you have a translationally invariant system. And you can actually write down everything. But uh, you will see in the coming slides that even this case, you can get something that is quantum out of it when you measure in a different basis. I'll explain what I mean by that. Uh, so if you write the unitary transformation, it's, it's like that. And then because of the linear, uh, uh, linear transformation, you have a similar transformation that uh, you saw in the linear optical network. Uh, but what is different here is that the lambda matrix or the scattering matrix would be a subclass of matrix. You cannot build uh, any random unitary using this uh, method. And that lambda, because of the uh, translation invariance, will have a specific, very specific uh, nature. They're called circular matrices, where the first row are you know, just circularly permute, and then you get the matrix. And in this case, uh, uh, the final probability distribution would be dependent on the permanent of these kind of matrices. So if you plot that out, oh, sorry, yeah. Ah uh, yes, um, I have done numerical simulations on both periodic and uh, uh, non-periodic, but this one is uh, periodic boundary condition. No. Yes, yes. I I wanted to be as simple uh, as we can. Yeah. Um, right. So if you so if if you plot uh, through this uh, anti-diagonal, you can see that it it has this kind of thing, and then this band where the amplitudes are appreciable. Uh, basically, uh, this bandwidth increases with, with time, with linear in, in time, and that is just a ballistic evolution. So if you start uh, the atoms at a point, you have this uh, uniform hopping and nearest neighbor, it will ballistically evolve uh, to that. And this bandwidth you can see is proportional to the time of evolution. Uh, so this is just on the anti-diagonal. Uh, I'm just plotting that. Uh, a squares. So, uh, so now if you if you want to study the sampling complexity of this very specific subclass of unitaries, uh, what you need to uh, show is what um, you know. You need to study how hard is it to calculate the permanent first. And if you look at that, uh, there exist algorithms that can approximate the permanent of these kind of matrices. Uh, but the scale scaling of that is n two to the four t. And uh, you can see that it's exponential in the time taken. Uh, so um, you can see the um, uh, references for that, the sequences. Uh, so, so all we could say in this is that no non-classical algorithm exists that can efficiently uh, solve this. Uh, so if time scales as a log n, time t is the time of evolution. Uh, you know, you start with a 
uh, uh, initial state, you let the system evolve according to the Hamiltonian. And as long as time t scales uh, log n, you can see that it's, it's easy. Uh, but you know, if you have some uh, linear uh, uh, scaling with time, then this algorithm fails. So this we put it out there as a conjecture, saying that even the simple case, there's a chance that uh, it might be hard. All right, so, uh, you know, uh, this is a very specific case and, and I already told that you cannot generate arbitrary unity transformation using this. So it not yet a one-to-one -one mapping to Boson sampling with photons. So for that to happen, uh, we need to be able to, uh, the exponential of the Hamiltonian uh, must be any hard random unity that you can think of. Uh, but for that, uh, you need to have arbitrary long range coupling. The LL prime has to be arbitrary then you can generate any unitary you want uh, but that is extremely challenging because long range hopping uh, is uh, not really possible so what what we did uh, um, in the same paper that uh, we used the for quantum control theory uh, to use quantum systems with nearest neighbor interaction but we made uh, the hopping and everything time dependent so you have a time dependent hamiltonian with nearest neighbor uh, and we can use quantum control and, and show that the system is controllable, et cetera. And we can then generate arbitrary entry matrices within uh, some time. So uh, uh, we have two scalable realization in optical lattices. So using a, a spinner lattice and also a quantum gas microscope, which uses optical tweezers, uh, you know, Adam Kaufman uh, at JLA Boulder. Uh, so what we did that we had these uh, Hamiltonian terms, which were time dependent. And we showed that the system is controllable and we had uh, numerical simulations that support that, that is given any hard random unity, you can come up with pulses that uh, generate that. So basically what this says is that using neutral atoms in optical lattice and nearest neighbor, you can actually implement boson sampling. Uh, right. So uh, this is something that I picked up at uh, University of New Mexico, you show random features in between uh, to give a pause, um, it's just, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, from my time in, in the US uh, before moving here. All right. Uh, so, uh, so we continued that work uh, to actually include interactions uh, in, in the Bose Hubbard model. So uh, now we have a Bose Hubbard model with, uh, with the interactions. And we can also include the chemical potential, but uh, this is what we work with. Uh, so you have uh, the part H naught without the interaction where it's linear in B dagger B or um, the number of operator. So that part is linear optics or, or linear transformation. But then when you have N square, it's no longer linear, right? So the probability distribution, you know, you, you start from an, everything else is the same. You start with some initial configuration, you let it evolve. With the Hamiltonian, after some time t, you measure uh, the number of atoms in different lattice sites. Uh, so it's very difficult to analyze this using uh, permanence because it's not a linear transformation. You don't have permanence coming uh, easily out of it. Uh, but we wanted to study this in a uh, for for different reason. That is, if if some experimental protocol they're they're trying to implement Boson sampling in neutral atoms they might have some residual interaction. So we wanted to see in the presence of weak residual interaction, can we say something about the sampling complexity? Are they, are they doing something hard or did they already lose it? Um, so studying complexity at weak interaction. And also we wanted to say something about what happens at arbitrary uh, long range or strong interactions. So because of the nonlinear transformation, it, it's no longer related to a permanent. Uh, Sorry, uh, because of the n square up there. So if you uh, look at the uh, unitary uh, exponential at Hamiltonian and the creation operators at each lattice side, if you see how they behave, it's no longer uh, just a linear combination of other uh, B daggers. Um, I just meant the unitary transformation that transforms input creation operators to the output creation operators. The operator is uh, linear, but it's not linear in the creation operators. So, yeah. 
so like aj dagger would not be written as sum mm -hmm. yeah 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 sorry confirm <laughs> yeah, I, 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 what is sum in the topic to part of the book of the many objects to sum? Yeah, I think that that very common, very like uh, it, you can make everything difficult by going into a different uh, basis. I think is very important, like uh, even in Boson sampling, that uh, the reason why single photon states you, you get. Uh, this kind of thing is because you count the number of photons and you are not doing any other measurement. For example, even in this, you start with the single photons and single atoms. And I had the translationally invariant system. If you were doing some kind of homodyne type of like, you know, you do the momentum measurements, you'd get very easy samples. But because of the fact that permanence, how you write the permanence depends on the basis in which you're right for determinant it, it the similarity transformation does not change determinant but for permanence it it does matter which basis you write it in yeah yeah but for determinant if it's if you do a similarity transformation the determinant remains the same but but the same property does not apply to permanent so you can find a basis in which the permanent is hard and you know it, it it's like uh, saying the clifford operation is easy but you know, you have to be careful what, what measurement you're doing. Uh, otherwise, it, you know, you can make it not easy. Uh, okay, so uh, for that, uh, we were just toying around with this Hubbard Saturnomy's transformation, uh, which, you know, uh, it's basically written there where uh, you can kind of change B square into uh, uh, terms with B. So what we did uh, was to change this nonlinear terms to effectively linear terms. Uh, so you have this N square terms, we can write it as an integral with uh, with n in it. So how do we do that in the circuit? So you have the exponential of the whole uh, Hamiltonian. Uh, we can do some Proto Suzuki uh, expansion, and everywhere you find this n square, uh, the v, the interaction term, you can replace that with an average uh, of that kind. So what this gives you is a, a way to connect the probability distribution in terms of permanence. So what we can get is this probability amplitude can be written as an average over several ensemble of, of permanence. Uh, because each of those uh, each of those terms would be linear and that they would be connected to a permanent. And we can write it as an average of ensemble of permanence. Yes. Not yet. Uh, that, that's in the next slide. So uh, this is something that we found uh, uh, you know, very interesting and, and I just wanted to present that. Uh, right, so this is where uh, the weak interaction limit comes in. So what we wanted to look at is uh, when the interaction is very weak, uh, can we say something about the sampling complexity? So there we used of this uh, total variation distance definition, you know, uh, which is defined like this. And uh, we wanted to uh, use the fact about approximate Boson sampling uh, in this case. So at, at what point uh, are you no longer in the weak interaction region and you cannot say anything about uh, the sampling complexity. So we found that uh, total variation distance can be bound in this way, where U is the interaction strength, T is the time of evolution, and N is the number of uh, atoms. So which means that uh, if we can make this a constant with respect to the N, which, is, which means that UT scales as one over N square, uh, we can make this uh, total variation distance constant, and using the approximate Boson sampling, you can say that it will have the same hardness of ideal Boson sampling. And uh, by saying that, 
you know, you can say that this is up to what interaction strength you can tolerate uh, in the experiment. How am I doing on time? Time is okay. So uh, let me just uh, also talk to you about the uh, some of the ideas that we had for arbitrary interaction strength. So when the interaction strength is arbitrary strong, we can no longer connect that to the ideal case when u equal to zero, uh, just as a perturbation. It, it's no longer in the perturbation regime. So uh, some uh, another technique that uh, we found interesting and we, we wanted to apply to this one was by Adam Boland and others uh, in the case of random circuit sampling. So it was called worst case to average case reduction technique. So what happens is that, so if you have a set of problem capital A, right? And uh, suppose this is true that uh, you can solve polynomial instances of A, that will give you uh, uh, a way to solve a, a small a. So basically these are com complexity classes and you are given that solving polynomial instances of capital A will let you solve small a. Then we can say that both of them have the same hardness, right? So if we can solve polynomial instances of one that leads to the so solution of another instance, um, we can connect them uh, using the complexity and and that is what is called a worst case to average case reduction technique. Uh, this small a is is kind of a worst case, and capital A is the average case. And small a is something that we know is hard. And we also show that solving polynomial instances of capital A will lead to a solution of small a. Then we know that on average, this capital A, the problems in capital A should also be hard. So uh, we use that in this one. Uh, in the sense that u equal to zero with no interaction is just the ideal Boson sampling. So we know the complexity of that, and we can take that as a worst case. And for random u or random ab, uh, arbitrary interaction strength, we can take that an average case. Uh, so what we could show was that the probability amplitude that we want to look at uh, in the Proto Suzuki approximation, we showed that that amplitude is very close. I mean, you can. Uh, the uh, specific ways to define what closeness is, but uh, for now I'll say it, it's close to a polynomial in U. So the amplitude that we want to look at is close to a polynomial in U and uh, using polynomial interpolation, that means given many data points what can fit a polynomial and uh, that can be extrapolated to U equal to zero case. So which means that given polynomial data points of random U, you can actually extrapolate that to get the uh, permanent at u equal to zero. So using the worst case to average case reduction technique, um, I can show that uh, on an average, even in presence of interaction, or the boson hubbard model, boson sampling is hard. There are many loopholes in this that we are still trying to uh, close because there are cases where polynomial interpolation may fail. Uh, and also uh, some things like, uh, and the concentration conjecture and all we are still trying to prove in this case. Uh, but this gives a, uh, a very high confidence that uh, even at high interactions, uh, sampling from a both Hubbard uh, corner system is hard for a classical computer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not averaging our different views. Uh, it is a single view. Yes. Uh, so you're asking using the same P for different U. So I'm, I'm just keeping P a constant and, and changing U. Uh, what I showed was it, it's very close to a polynomial. Um, Uh, I don't, I would think maybe not, yeah, because we, we are only interested in some case u equal to zero that we know is hard and we want to get, get there uh, by only using polynomial data points, polynomial meaning data points. So if I can show that it's a polynomial, we know that you only need polynomial points uh, to get the curve. 
yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if you have to use the same tool. But yeah. Yeah, you can. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, so uh, yeah. Uh, before I, I mean, this is my basically my last slide. But uh, before I finish, I want to you know, again shamelessly advertise myself. Uh, you know, just because I have such a nice audience here. Uh, this is another work that I did with Rolanda Soma at Los Alamos, uh, algorithms for thermal state preparation. And if uh, if anyone is going to quantum information processing (QIP) in in Belgium. Uh, Burak, my uh, my co-author Burak will be talking about this on on Friday, two thirty. So uh, please, if you're going, uh, yeah, give it a hear and and uh, let us know uh, what you think of it. Uh, all right. So in in, in summary, uh, I, I'll just like to say that uh, you know uh, you don't have to use photons for boson sampling. You can also use neutral atoms, uh, and it. Uh, and yeah, and we show that even in the presence of interaction, in the presence of weak interaction, we show uh, for a fact that sampling bosons is hard. Uh, but in the case of arbitrary interaction, we have very good evidence that it, it might be hard and, and we're still working on that. Uh, yeah, and uh, I would like to thank uh, Ivan Akimasa, Adrian Chapman, maybe some of you remember, he was at University of Sydney uh, for postdoc, and Sharini, who is at IMQ now. And yeah, the funding. Thank you. For the last break, we have some time for questions. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To scale one hour and square because yeah uh, because I know uh, uh, e times t yeah yes Um, I haven't really looked at the numeric thing. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So yeah, we we kind of use that technique in our case. But the, uh, as I said, there are still uh, some more things to do, like anti concentration conjecture. We couldn't show um, that in our case yet, but uh, we are hopeful. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. 